This program is brought to you by Link TV for educational and non-commercial use only. Mosaic, a daily news program from Link TV, presents a selection of news reports from independent and state-controlled broadcasters from throughout the Middle East. Iranian authorities said that a number of foreigners were detained for participating in demonstrations on the day of Ashura. The authorities said that the detainees launched what it called a psychological war against the regime. A number of foreigners are among the detainees. The most important factor is that these foreigners called for a psychological war against the regime. They entered Iran two days before the day of Ashra. Their cameras were confiscated along with the other equipment that were found. This comes at a time when Judiciary Chief Sadek Larejini had warned that harsher measures will be taken against the protesters. The Iranian political scene is witnessing multiple positions and reactions from local and international groups. In Tehran, former President Mohammad Khatami warned of undermining the stability of the religious authority and of directing internal conflicts to it. He emphasized his respect for Yusuf Sanai's authority and stated that he does not doubt his efforts. Khatami also supported the religious leader Asadullah Bayat Zanjani. Khatami and Zanjani's positions were confronted by a call from the Association of Science Teachers in Qum, asking that Sanai be removed as a source of emulation. These developments came at a time when political sources announced that Professor of Philosophy Mr. Sadr Amir Damadi, uncle of the Supreme Leader Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, was detained by security authorities for several hours on Wednesday. This took place during the conflict between students from the University of Mashhad and Basij forces, which led to more than 40 wounded. These conflicts intensified when the head of judiciary, Sadek Larajani, threatened to use harsher measures against the protesters, indicating that Wiliyat Afaki and the security of the regime are two red lines that are not allowed to be crossed. Perhaps the most prominent event in today's Iranian political crisis was the initiative by reform leader Mir Hossein Musabi, consisting of five points. Five prominent figures published a joint document announcing their absolute support for the initiative, seeing it as a good solution to the current crisis. Internationally, the European Congress on Human Rights Research announced the postponement of its delegation's visit to Iran after 15 members considered the timing inappropriate, especially with the violations that Iran has been witnessing. French Foreign Minister Bernard Kuchner criticized the cruelty practiced against the reformists, considering it a reaffirmation of the belief that the Iranian regime is facing serious threats and pressures. Hassani Shiadi, Al Arabiya. Al Arabiya. According to our Al Jazeera correspondent, a Yemeni security source has confirmed that two people were killed and three others were wounded in clashes that erupted in the tribal district of Arhab, north of Sana'a. The source added that the raid was intended to capture a key suspect wanted on earlier charges of kidnapping a Japanese tourist. While the suspect, who is affiliated with Al-Qaeda, was able to escape, two of his aides were killed and three others were wounded. Meanwhile, the U.S. and the British embassies in Sana'a remain closed for the second consecutive day following threats made by al-Qaeda against U.S. and British installations in Yemen. France also closed its embassy for the same reason. Meanwhile, Japan has suspended all consular activities in its embassy in Sana'a. 
في سفارتها بصنعاء للسبب ذاته. مراسلنا في صنعاء. Our correspondent in Sanaa, Murad Hashim, has the details in the following report. انتهى لقاء الرئيس اليمني علي عبد الله صالح. The meeting between the Yemeni president Ali Abdullah Saleh and General David Petraeus, head of the U.S. Central Command, has ended with both sides calling for more cooperation in countering Al Qaeda threats. The meeting was followed by heightened security measures around U.S. and Western embassies and installations. The U.S. and the British embassies remain temporarily closed to the public. The two embassies were targeted by Al Qaeda in previous attacks. The decision to close the embassies was based on intelligence information of imminent attacks by Al Qaeda. This issue has undoubtedly caused alarm inside Yemen. From our experience during the past years and recent days, we noticed that the Western countries have always taken precautionary measures by closing their embassies upon receiving a threat. So this is not strange. Having said that, we are very confident that our security agencies are capable of countering any threats by Al Qaeda. The war on Al Qaeda in Yemen is not new. However, placing it as the U.S. and British top priority, which may translate into a wide-scale confrontation in Yemen, comes as a surprise to many Yemenis. Al Qaeda has reorganized and widened its platform by attracting Yemeni, Arab, and foreign fighters. It seems that Al Qaeda has been preparing for a confrontation with its Western opponents. This recent awakening witnessed in Yemen was due to foreign factors. We could openly say that the Americans were behind the emergence of this new awakening movement in Yemen. It is not shameful that Yemen has started to take serious steps to counter Al-Qaeda and terrorism. The Yemeni counterterrorism forces were founded and trained years ago by the U.S. Many believe that additional U.S. support will likely enhance Yemeni capabilities of countering al-Qaeda. However, it will not weaken it. Al-Qaeda's strength is being attributed to several factors, including the weakness of the Yemeni military and the corruption that is wasting the country's resources and deepening poverty, in addition to the political crises rocking the country from its south to its north. All these factors helped create a breeding environment for al-Qaeda, which continues to expand its influence beyond Yemeni boundaries. Yemen Houthi fighters say at least 16 people have been killed in a series of Saudi airstrikes in the north of the country during the past two days. The Houthis say six people were killed and six others wounded on Sunday as Saudi warplanes bombed residential areas near the border. They also say Saudi airstrikes in a local market in the region killed at least 10 people and wounded 13 more on Saturday. This is the fighters have announced that they are ready for dialogue with the governments once the Yemeni and Saudi militaries halt their attacks against civilians. Hundreds have been killed and tens of thousands of civilians displaced after the Yemeni military launched a massive offensive in the country's north back in August. The Saudi military joined the operation in November. France has joined the U.S. and Britain to close their embassies in Yemen with a countdown for a new war beginning in the country. The French foreign ministry has cited security reasons for the move. Japan also says its embassy in Sanaa retains limited consular and visa application services. Tokyo media sources say the decision is made over a possible terrorist attack on the embassy staff. Italy also says it has limited public access to its embassy in Yemen. On Sunday, Washington closed its embassy in Sanaa on the grounds of threats from al-Qaeda. London has quickly followed in the U.S. footsteps and it has also shut down its embassy there. Latest reports say the British and U.S. officials have agreed to fund special counter-extremism police units in Yemen. Well, for more on that, we're now joined by Sabit Salam, political analyst from Damascus. Mr. Salam, several European embassies have been closed in Yemen, as you know. Many say this indicates that the countdown to another U.S.-led war has begun. Tell us about your thoughts. What's your take on that? Well, it's quite strange what's going on in Yemen now, but uh, the series of uh, these uh, uh, preparations by the West in general 
when it starts by the United States, then Britain and the rest of Europe uh, f uh, uh, follow. Uh, it is, there is always a big question mark. Nobody can understand why. But the coincidence which really uh, uh, astonishes us is why whenever there is Al-Qaeda, uh, uh, there are uh, uh, problems, and then the Americans come in as an excuse. This happened in Afghanistan, then it was in Iraq, uh, in Yemen, now in Yemen, and before that in Somalia. The Egyptian president also held talks with Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas that focused on the peace process. The Palestinian president said he was ready to restart negotiations without hesitation, but in parallel to the halting of Israeli settlement activity. He also called on Hamas to support the Egyptian proposal. But Abbas gave no indication of any resumption soon of peace talks with Israel. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu last week made a proposal for an Egyptian-hosted summit with Abbas. First of all, we don't have any objections to the negotiations entirely, and it should be understood that we have no conditions. But we said it before and still saying that we are ready to resume negotiations without hesitation, and this is parallel to settlements stopping, in addition to the international reference recognition. So the issue is still as it is, and we agree with the Egyptian decisions. Shortly after the Mubarak Abbas meeting, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said he is prepared to enter immediate talks with the Palestinian Authority without preconditions. Speaking at the start of his Likud party meeting in Jerusalem, Netanyahu said that he had noticed a change in the atmosphere that may allow a resumption of peace talks with the Palestinians. <laughs> Israel is prepared to enter into negotiations immediately with the Palestinian Authority without preconditions. Certainly during these negotiations, each side is free to raise its positions and we are serious in our intention to reach a peace agreement. But we will insist the results of these negotiations will be set around the negotiating table at the end of the process and certainly not at its start. As Netanyahu convened his party leadership, Jewish settlers converged on Jerusalem to protest against Netanyahu's settlement construction freeze by symbolically smashing a model of a house made of ice. The UN General Assembly has unanimously approved a draft resolution calling for the right of the Palestinian people to self-determination. The draft resolution was adopted by a vote of 176 countries in favor and six against it, including the U.S. and the Zionist entity. A new resolution was added to a list of many UN resolutions on the Palestinian cause. The UN General Assembly has unanimously approved a draft resolution calling for the right of the Palestinian people to self-determination. The draft resolution was adopted by a vote of 176 countries in favor of it and six against it, including the U.S. and the Zionist entity, with three countries abstaining. The UN General Assembly believes that the time has come to resume the peace negotiations in accordance with the Mideast peace process as mandated by UN resolutions and the Madrid Conference. This includes the launching efforts to reactivate the Land for Peace principle, the Arab Peace Initiative, and the Roadmap for Peace, which will in turn help broker a lasting solution to the Palestinian Zionist conflict. The draft resolution reaffirms the right of the Palestinian people to self-determination, which includes the right of establishing an independent Palestinian state. It also urges all countries, special agencies and UN institutions to continue their support for the Palestinian people and their right to self-determination. 
It seems that the international community, with the exception of the U.S., has become convinced that it's time to end the injustice facing the Palestinian people, an injustice that was made possible by the U.N. Partition Plan for Palestine, which paved the way for the creation of a Jewish entity on Palestinian land. Joining us in the studio is Dr. Atef Adwan, a member of the Palestinian Legislative Council. Welcome, Dr. Adwan. Let's first talk about the U.S. veto of this latest U.N. resolution. The U.S. continues to oppose any resolution in favor of Palestinian interests. Why is that? In the name of God, the most graceful, the most merciful. Historically, the U.S. was the first country to recognize Israel as a member state of the international community. Since then and up to this date, the U.S. has always supported Israel. The U.S. support of Israel is unconditional, whether Israel is right or wrong, and it is always wrong. The United States has exercised its UN veto power more than 87 times, and in each time it was for Israel's sake. Consequently, the latest action by the United States is no surprise for us. Actually, everyone here expected it. Having said that, this action doesn't support the slogan of change launched by the new U.S. administration and its president, Barack Obama. Obama announced in Cairo and other parts of the Arab and Islamic worlds that he is planning to change U.S. policy in the region. However, he has failed tremendously of making any changes in the region. The current U.S. administration is serving Israeli interests more than any of its predecessors. Politicians and members of the Muslim community in Denmark called on turning the page of the cartoons harmful to Islam and to the response they generated. They said during a political campaign that it has been five years since the incident and that it is time to forgive. They also said that the Somali young man's attempt to kill the cartoonist Kurt Westergaard was unjustifiable. These images were widely broadcast around the Islamic world showing angry protesters burning the flags of Denmark and other European countries and the U.S. This took place after some newspapers in Denmark published cartoons of the Prophet Muhammad, which is considered offensive to Islam and Muslims. Even though it's been five years since the incident took place, its complications carry on. Most recently, a Somali young man with alleged connections to Somali armed Islamic groups attempted to attack Danish cartoonist Kurt Westergaard. In Denmark, the Muslim community, which forms 3 percent of the population, has started to demand a halt to the retaliations. They said that the Danish society did not commit any sins other than some absurd cartoon, and that it is time for forgiveness and to put an end to the excessive reactions. My point is that the person who actually In my opinion, the person who actually tried to kill the person was wrong. The caricature was a long time ago. It's history now. We should forget about it. It's a long time ago. It's a history now. Danish Muslims are calling to put an end to this issue. They established a political entity called the Movement of Democratic Muslims to distinguish themselves from those who call for retaliation. Four or five years ago, the cartoon. It was four or five years ago when the cartoon was published in the newspapers, but the Islamic jihadis and the terrorists never forgive. Some consider the campaign initiated by Muslim political activists to be an expression of the importance to contain the anger that a number of Danish people feel towards what they call unjustifiable actions of violence. I think it's terrible that the I think it's terrible that they just won't let people live their lives because someone drew a cartoon. They still remember and still want revenge. These Danish people say that it is time to close the case of the cartoon that hurt the Muslims' feelings and the violent reaction to it. On the other hand, some Muslim communities in Europe and other regions still insist on boycotting Denmark. 
Even Arab political analysts and media have started to doubt the motives of these calls and their timing, and the way in which they complicate the life of the Muslim community in Europe. Wael Hajar, BBC. The 31st wave of Iraqi detainees released from American occupation prisons in Kirkuk were extremely happy and had big smiles on their faces. With joyful singing, the Kirkuk Provincial Council received the 31st wave of Iraqi detainees released from American prisons. They were released and handed over to their families in the presence of civic organization representatives. The total number of released Iraqi detainees in Kirkuk by the American forces has reached 261. A number of Iraqi detainees were released from American prisons in Puka. They were received by the Kirkuk Provisional Council. The prisoners are from different areas in Kirkuk and the suburbs, such as Wika, Riyadh and Taza. Of course, they were handed over to their families. The successful program of releasing Iraqi detainees in the province of Kirkuk started in March 2008, based on the security agreement between Iraq and the U.S. Innocent Iraqis have been released from occupation prisons. Their hands were not stained with Iraqi blood. They were imprisoned based on false testimonies by people who have personal animosities against them. The Iraqi government must demand the release of young and old Iraqis who have been detained for extended periods of time, in some cases for more than five years. They have been imprisoned for no legitimate reasons. Many were detained based on false testimonies by people who have personal animosities against them. The released prisoners demanded compensation from the Iraqi government for years of wrongful imprisonment. They also demanded that the government help them find jobs and reintegrate them into Iraqi society. We demand that the Iraqi government compensate us for the wrong imprisonment. Two years of my life were wasted. Everyone was working to support their families. We were not planning to spend time in a prison. Now we have to catch up. Of course, we would like to get married and do have other plans. Also, our education was derailed. It seems that the American forces are playing a cat-and-mouse game. They release waves of Iraqi detainees only to arrest new innocent ones, unfairly and for no legitimate reasons. They did not commit crimes, rather they are being imprisoned for political reasons. Baghdad Satellite Channel, Mohammed al Jaf, Kirkuk. The people of Dubai and the United Arab Emirates have expressed great joy after their government announced the opening of the world's tallest tower, dubbed the Burj Dubai. Measuring more than 800 meters in height, the Burj Dubai is considered to be a one-of-a-kind architectural skyscraper. Burj Dubai is the most prominent architectural accomplishment in modern history. It's an accomplishment that will add a distinctive feature to Dubai among its rivals in the world. This accomplishment will help uphold Dubai's status as a city of Emirate identity, Arab affiliation and international ambitions. The opening of the Burj Dubai is a tangible outcome of the righteous policy of the ruler of Dubai, His Royal Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum, who is known for his renown saying, we don't talk, but we accomplish. More than two billion people from around the world are expected to watch this great event, which coincides with the inauguration of His Royal Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum as ruler of Dubai. The opening of the Burj Dubai is attracting the attention of spectators around the world. The tower is the tallest man-made building on the surface of Earth. More than 400 journalists from various international and Arab news services and television stations are expected to cover the event. The journey leading to the development of this architectural landmark will be the highlight of a symphonic song of three parts. 
The performance will be broadcast live via large screens transmitting from the Birch Park Island, in addition to other broadcast screens distributed along the waterfront. The inauguration will begin by showing a short documentary narrating the journey of developments in Dubai, with special emphasis on the efforts leading to the building of the tallest tower in the world. From the Rose of the Desert to the Dubai Tower, this is the first part of the ceremony, which will include water and light performances as well as fireworks. The second part is titled Heartbeats, and it's a sound effect performance narrating the construction phases of Burj Dubai. The performance will end after a powerful beam lights the tower, forming a wonderful image of it. The third part is titled From Dubai and the Emirate to the World and includes a performance in which white light beams are used to light the tower. The celebration ends with a display of fireworks, which includes more than 10,000 colorful displays, starting from the top of the tower and illuminating the entire area around it. Get more news about the Middle East online at linktv.org slash mosaic. The Mosaic webpage offers a complete archive of Mosaic programs, program transcripts, the Mosaic video podcast, and the Mosaic Intelligence Report, a weekly analysis of the hottest stories from the Middle East. The views expressed on Mosaic are those of the participating broadcasters, not Link TV or its sponsors. The production of Mosaic is made possible with the support of viewers like you. Thank you. This program is brought to you by Link TV for educational and non commercial use only. Link TV is the only U.S. network dedicated to global and national news, uncompromising documentaries, and diverse cultural programs, programs which connect you to the world.